God is with us. But the weird thing is, is that a question that seems to be threaded throughout my entire story is, God, where are you? After years of asking this, myself this question, I found myself sitting on a couch in a counselor's office, staring blankly at the wall, wondering how on earth life could even go on. But I also bet that I am not the only one in this room who has asked this question before. And maybe you asked, God, where are you, when your parents sat you and your siblings down on the couch and said the word divorce, and you're forced to live with a reality that you never thought you would be. Or maybe you asked, God, where are you, when you were staring blankly at the casket of someone you didn't think you could live life without. Or maybe you asked, God, where are you, when you, all of your plans were shattered right in front of your eyes and you had nowhere left to turn. This question, God, where are you, it's not really a new one, but the ironic thing is, is that the idea of God being with his people is woven throughout the entire narrative of scripture. You see, all the way back in the Garden of Eden, we know that God was with Adam and Eve, but we also know with that first disobedient bite of the fruit, our relationship with God was left unhinged and broken, and the rest of the Old Testament lives in the shadow of this moment. Our relationship with the Lord was broken, but God was still with his people. And we know that God was with Noah and his family when they built an ark and they had a really big boat in their backyard and probably used up the whole entire town's wood supply. God was there. Uh, God was with Moses when he went before Pharaoh and he led the Israelites out of Egypt. And God was with Gideon when he... All logic told him that he needed a really big army, but God told him to size it down to just 300. And we know that God was with King Josiah when he found the book of the law and had it read in public, and it brought about repentance in all of the land. And we know God was with Samuel, even though the people rejected him and asked for a king. And we know God was with Job, even when he did not get an explanation for the crazy suffering that he was enduring. And we know God was with the prophets as they proclaimed the truth of God, yet most of their listeners turned their faces away. So from Genesis to Malachi, God is with his people. From Judah to Jerusalem, from Eden to Egypt, from Bethel to Babel, from, Saul, from Sodom to Sinai, and from Tyre to Tarshish, God was there. And from the burning bush into the belly of the fish, and from the temple to the tabernacle, and from the prophecies to the promised land, and from the pillar of fire to the pits of a prison, God chased after his people. And from Ahab to Ruth, and from the prophets to the Psalms, and from the fleeing to being faithful, and from woe to worship, and from, cre and from creation to captivity, God was there. And even in the midst of all of the kings whose names seem to start with J and they rhyme and we could not remember for our Old Testament history classes, God was in their midst as well. But even though God was near his people, there was a separation. He longed to be even closer. He longed to be with us, not just near us. In the book of Isaiah, the Israelites were experiencing great oppression under the Assyrian Empire and they were in need of some kind of hope and deliverance. There was great anticipation for this coming Messiah, as we see in the prophecies of Isaiah. So Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then in Isaiah 9, chapter 2, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on whom the light has shone. And then scroll down to verse 6. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. God was with them, even as they waited. But something's still missing. And when we get to this thin page that is in between our two testaments, the tension is thick. They are waiting for something. The whole entire Old Testament has led up to this moment. God has been with his people all along, but something needs to happen to restore their relationship to him. The echoes of this broken relationship were in the lives of the people, and they were groaning, and they were waiting 
A piece of the puzzle is missing, and God's people have been searching for it for centuries, and they keep coming up dry. This morning, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 1. We're going to take a journey back to that dirty feeding trough in the city of Bethlehem and hear what Matthew has to say about the birth of Jesus Christ, starting in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, as he did, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> The whole Old Testament has been waiting in eager expectation for this moment, for the time when God would come down and be with his people, and it is here. The people probably knew the prophecies of Isaiah 7 really well, and they wanted God to be with them in a different way, and they wanted to see the great light that Isaiah 9 talks about. But I would bet money on the fact that they did not expect it to look this way. And by taking a look at Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus, we gain two bits of information that tell us why this instance of God with us in the person of Jesus is different than God being with us throughout the Old Testament. So the first is that the birth of Jesus offers us a physical presence of God that has never been known up until this point. God breaks all boundaries to physically be with his people, and he went to great lengths to get there. The fact that the divine became man is magnificent, but it also speaks louder than any words probably ever could. God decided to come to earth in the least glamorous way possible, and he traded his throne up, on, up in heaven for a dirty feeding trough in Bethlehem, and he traded his fellowship with the Father for friendship with mere fishermen. fishermen. Perhaps no longer people have to stare blankly into the sky asking, God, where are you? But they can look right in front of them and see that the Savior of the world is right in front of them. But Jesus was also born in the midst of a relationship scandal. I mean, Joseph, the most honorable thing that he could have done at that point was divorce Mary quietly, but he didn't. Jesus came in the midst of messiness and brokenness, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. He wanted to be a part of our brokenness and our messiness, and that is making a bold statement. Brokenness doesn't scare him away. And the second thing that this offers us is a, it offers us the presence of a savior who stays. So Jesus came in the form of, ba of a baby, and he could have come and zipped in and out real quick like he had in, done in the past, but he came to stay. He came to be with us. Matthew tells us that Jesus will be his name, but he will also be called Emmanuel. And last time I checked, we don't really walk around saying things like, Emmanuel preached the Sermon on the Mount, and Emmanuel healed the sick, and Emmanuel loves me. But Emmanuel isn't his name in the same sense that Jesus is. You see, Jesus describes what he came to do, so God saves. And then Emmanuel describes what he did. What? No, I'm going to say that again. Jesus describes what he does, which is God saves, and Emmanuel describes who he is. So in his very essence, he describes that God is with us. He carries the aroma of God being with us. All that Emmanuel is received its fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ, and God's presence was here to stay and not go anywhere. So we started with the question, God, where are you? But I think Jesus made it emphatically clear that he is with us. And it's obvious, 
though, that Jesus isn't sitting in this room. He's not sitting in the front row, wearing his chacos with his Nalgene in hand, taking notes. And I don't really see babies in mangers everywhere either. So what do we do when we can't see God in presence, like when he's not physically here with us? And if you're anything like me, you might pray for God to reveal himself to you in a tangible way, for you to be able to just see him. Sometimes I think, if I can just get a hug from God and just for him to let me know that it's going to be okay, it might cure this intense feeling of loneliness that I have or this fear that I have of what's going to happen when I graduate from this place in May. I think that this physical manifestation would cure that. But when Jesus left this earth, he didn't leave us without the promise of him being with us or without hope. Jesus may not be on earth with us today in physical body, but he did leave us with three things that promise us of the hope that he is with us. And the first is the church. So Jesus came to earth and he established the church. He raised up disciples so that they could go and share the good news of what he did when he came. And the church also offers us a physical presence of just the body of believers. And I bet if I asked a handful of you what your favorite part about Ozark is, the first thing that you would blurt out to me is community. And I think that that in and of itself is Emmanuel. That is God being with us. When we look at each other, we can see Christ more fully. And the second thing that he left us with is the word of God. We all memorize 2 Timothy 2, no, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God has given us his word so that we might gain a deeper understanding of who he is and what he is saying to us. And the third thing that he left us with is the Holy Spirit. So Matthew ends his gospel in a similar way that he began it, with Jesus himself saying, and behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus didn't leave without the promise of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus may not be walking with us, but he is dwelling within us. And that's Emmanuel, isn't it? So the church, the word of God, and the Holy Spirit do prove to us that God is with us. So when I found out that this was my sermon topic, I began to pray, Lord, please show me what Emmanuel looks like in my life. I want to see what it looks like. And so here are a few different pictures of Emmanuel that the Lord has given me throughout the semester. So Emmanuel looks like what feels like half of my dorm floor, sitting on my bed, singing Christmas carols at 10 o'clock at night and waking everyone up. Uh, Emmanuel looks like um, sunrise, watching the sunrise with the Lord on a quiet morning. Emmanuel looks like sitting down by the creek, journaling and sitting in my Eno. Emmanuel looks like going to Chick-fil-A with my best friends after a long day at work. And the list goes on and on. So look up and see that Emmanuel is all around you. The echoes of that first Christmas are everywhere. So next time you find yourself asking the question, God, where are you? In an accusatory tone, shift your cursing and anxiety to curiosity and expectation and ask, God, where are you? With expectation, knowing that he is with us. So from engagements to exegetical papers and from breakups to book reports and from depression to devos and from praying to procrastinations, God is with you. And from late nights in the library to early morning scramming and to dorm life and dance parties and study sessions in the stew and confrontations in the calf and crying during chapel and mistakes in the missions building, God is with you. God is with you when you're trying to finish up your last minute assignments of the semester. God is with you in your anxiety about going home because your family's a mess and you don't know what's going to happen when you get there. God is with you when you're trying to figure out your next steps, but every single resume seems to come back rejected. God is with you when you're too depressed to even get out of bed and go to class. And God is with you even when your fleeing feelings tell you that he is not. Friends, God is with you.
first picture we have of you is going to be in this museum. And I thank you for everything you've done to keep that promise. Through history, through the sending of your son, I thank you that you are with us. Open our eyes to see your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was almost finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is almost finished. Of course, we know that's not what that text actually says, but we sure live like that's what it says. I've learned a lot during my time here at Ozark. I've learned a lot of things. I've learned how to exegete scripture well and how to, how to teach the Bible and all of these really, really important skills. But perhaps one of the most important lessons that I've learned here at Ozark is that I'm bad at some things. Like really, really bad at some things. One example of this is art. I'm not an artist. I don't claim to be. I don't pretend to be. But I don't just want to tell you that. I, everybody says they're a bad artist. No, I can only draw a stick figure. I actually brought an illustration with me to show you how bad of an artist I am. <laughs> I walked into work at the ARC a couple weeks ago. I worked there. Here's my obligatory ARC plug. Go there. It's cool. I walked into work a couple weeks ago, and some of my coworkers said, hey, we've decided we're all going to draw self-portraits. Here's the catch. You have to do it with your eyes closed. And I said, this is a terrible idea. And they encouraged me, no, this is a great idea. I said, I promise you it's not. This is on the main whiteboard right behind our front desk for everyone to see. And if you look at this picture, you might notice a couple things. You might notice Sam's picture, which is very well done. You might notice Jessica's picture, which looks like a person. Or Derek's, or Gabe's. And then you notice this thing in the top left corner... which has been described as a lumpy potato. <laughs> I'm not very good at art. I don't pretend to be. I've given up on that dream. I don't have any aspirations to be the next Leonardo da Vinci. I'm over it. There's some things, though, in my life that I really try to be good at, and I'm just not very good at them. I was a silly example, but I want to get a little bit more serious today. The thing I'm talking about is I'm not very good at saving myself. I'm guessing you're not very good at saving yourself either, but here's the thing, we try and do it all the time. In fact, it's hardwired into who many of us are, so much so that if you ever train to be a lifeguard, or if you've ever been a lifeguard, you know that there's a reason they have those giant oversized pool noodle things. I don't know what they're actually called, so we're going to go with oversized pool noodles. It's because you're not supposed to go and grab a drowning person. That's like rule number one in lifeguard training. You don't go and grab a drowning person unless you have no other way to save them. You hand them the giant pool noodle thing. Because when you're drowning, your first reaction is to save yourself at all costs. And it doesn't matter what you have to grab onto or who you have to push down. And you'll see this all over the news. So often when, when there's a drowning incident... It wasn't the person who started drowning that ends up on the news. You know, the person who was struggling turns out okay. Because somebody else went in after them to save them who didn't know this principle. And the person who was drowning pushed them under so long that the person who went in to save them drowns. Why? Because we're so caught up in saving ourselves. We don't care who or what we have to grab onto or what we have to push down. And of course, that's a physical example. I want to get more spiritual today. So often we try and save ourselves spiritually. Since the beginning of time, we've known that there's this gap between us and God. Ever since that first sin, there's this gap there. This gap that we know we can't cross. And so what do we do? We try and fill it with our own stuff. We try and play God. And really, it shouldn't be that surprising to us. After all, it is the very first temptation. It's the very first thing that Satan went and tempted Eve with. What were Satan's words? What was his temptation? We find it in Genesis 3. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, 
knowing good and evil. And so from the very beginning of time, we've been trying to close this gap on our own. We've been trying to become like God. We've been trying to save ourselves. And we try and close that gap, even though we know we can't. And so we chase after that 4.0 GPA. We chase after the biggest scholarship or the right life group leader or living on the right dorm floor or pursuing the right major or Tuesday tour guests, choosing the right college. I remember that. I've been there. You feel this immense pressure on you. Like if you choose the right place, God is going to like you more. That's not true. And we fill it up with all, I mean, that's just the beginning. These are just things that I've struggled with in my life. We could keep going. Being a successful church leader, you have these dreams of becoming a mega church pastor. And in your heart of hearts, even though you'd like to say it's because you want to reach people for Christ, in your heart of hearts, you know because you feel like if you become a mega church pastor, you've proved to God that you were worth saving. You try to be the best worship leader out there. You try to be the most popular. You want to be the poster child. Why? So you can fill up. So, you, so that you can finish what Jesus started. Because what he did wasn't good enough. You got to fill it in. You got to prove that you were worthy. You got to prove that you were worth saving. The Apostle Paul addresses this issue in the book of Philippians. And here's the thing Paul's a really cool guy. He's done a lot of really great stuff, he wrote a lot of our New Testament. We would all agree that Paul's a guy to look up to. Here's what Paul says in Philippians 3. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks they have reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And here he goes. He starts listing some of the great things about him. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of Hebrews. This is where it gets really good. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as... The word here is rubbish, but I want to change it because we don't use that word very often since we're not British. I want to paint a picture for you that's a little bit more vivid. So I'm going to change it to have suffered the loss of all things and count them all as a heaping pile of dirty used diapers. That's what Paul's talking about here. That's how strong this word is. It's a giant pile of stinky old used diapers in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Here's the bottom line that Paul's getting to. All those things that you value, all those things you've been holding on to, all those things you've been grasping on to, and I don't know what it is for you. I don't know if it's you want to be the best preacher in the room, the best worship pastor in the room, the best professor in the room, the best administrator in the room, the best teacher, the best police officer, the best student. I don't know what it is, but he's saying it's garbage. Throw it to the side. It doesn't matter. And the reality is everything we're going to talk about today, all the things, the examples I'm going to list, they're good. I'm not saying don't get good grades. I'm not saying don't go to class. I'm not saying don't value your memory work. But here's the thing. Why are you doing it? Far too often we do the right thing for the wrong reason. Listen, that, that's not going to save you. If that's why you're doing it, it's to prove your worth to God, to prove that you were worth it. Stop. The reality is, so often in my life, I struggle with this feeling of unworthiness. That, that Jesus gave everything for me. That he sacrificed everything for me. And I struggle and I want to prove to God that I'm worthy. And in the end, it doesn't actually matter what I think or how I feel about how God feels about me. He's already told me he thinks I'm worthy. And the truth is, I'm not. I'm a sinner just like everybody else in this room. But God has already decided that I'm worth it. I don't have to keep trying and going and doing it. The author of Hebrews points this out to us in a passage that's, that's really common, but we read far too fast, far too often of the time. In Hebrews 12, 
we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all these people who have gone before us, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. What is he talking about there? He's talking about what we've been talking about so far. He's talking about your grace. He's talking about your desire to be successful. He's talking about your need to save yourself. Throw that stuff aside and run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, some of the best advice I've gotten since I've been at Ozark came to me. It was a passing comment in the class, but it was worth every single penny of tuition that all of us will pay. It's really easy. It's just to read the Bible slowly. The Bible is a book that was meant to be read slowly. So I want to read that again because there's a word in here that's critical, but we skip over it too often. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's what the author of Hebrews is telling you. Jesus was glad to take your place. He wanted to take your place. He was joyful in taking your place. You don't have to prove that you're worthy. Jesus wanted to be there. You didn't force him onto that cross. He laid his life down for you. Hear me today. God is for you. Jesus died for you. And he's proved that to you over and over and over again. He shows us all over the place. I mean, you can open just about any page in your Bible today and read a chapter of it and at the end of the chapter realize, man, that chapter was just about how God is for me. About how God loves me. He desires a relationship with me. Mackenzie did an amazing job of laying out the truth that God is with us. That's so important. But we have to balance that with the truth that God is also for us. God isn't just with you. He's for you. He gave everything for you. He loves you and he desires you and he's shown that to you. He showed that to you starting with a kiss. I mean, I can't think of many things out in life that are more intimate than a kiss. Touching somebody with your lips. There's, man, there's not many things that you can do that are closer than that. And that's what Jesus went through from one of his best friends in the world. One of 12 people that he spent three years of his life with every single day. And he walked up to him and he gave him a kiss. And with that, began the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus did that for you. But that wasn't it. That's just the beginning. That's where it all started. Then Jesus goes through an unjust trial. And he gets found guilty even though he's innocent. And he goes through flogging. And you've learned from your life of Christ class. It wasn't the whipping motion that hurt. We're not supposed to think Indiana Jones in this scene. No, it was the glass and the bone and all of these things that were tied into the whip that grabbed on to Jesus' flesh. And then were ripped off of him. That's what hurt. He went through that 39 times. 39 It was so painful. It it exposed so much flesh, so much blood and guts and gore that it was not uncommon for people to die just from the flogging. Jesus went through that for you. And, And then there's this moment where Jesus is mocked. The king of the universe, the creator of the world, didn't get the crown he deserved. Rather, he got some weeds with giant thorns on them, twisted into a circle and shoved onto his head so that he would bleed, so that they could mock him. He went through that for you. And then they made him carry his own cross. The very thing that he would die on, he had to carry. The Via Della Rosa, the road that Jesus walked on, on to get to the hill of Golgotha is about 650 yards. That's six and a half football fields, which if we're being honest, if we're walking, really isn't that terrible. 
Pretty much everybody in this room could walk that without too much effort today. But imagine having to carry an 80-pound crossbeam on your back when you do that. Imagine being beaten so bad that you are basically on the verge of death and having to walk that. I can't even begin to fathom the pain that that would be. Jesus went through that for you. But all that, that was just the beginning. Jesus knew the pain that was coming his way. That it had only just begun. Hear me today. I don't know what's holding you back. I don't know what weight you're holding on to. I don't know the sin that you're keeping next to you. The sin that's clinging in your life. Here's my question. Why are you still holding on to it? We've been going through this series, Still True, and we've been laying down some of the foundational truths of the Bible. But, then, but the two that we've talked about today, that God is with us and God is for us, I don't... If those things are true, if the, the two most foundational principles in all of Christianity, if those things are true, that Jesus came down to be with you and to be for you, then your entire life should be centered around that truth. Nothing else should get in the way. Jesus cleared the path for you. He, he covered the gap. So that you could be with God. So why are you still holding on to those weights? Why are you still holding on to that sin? Jesus covered you. It's by his wounds that we're healed. It's because of his death that we get to live. Hear me today. If you ever doubt that God is for you. You don't have to look any farther than the cross. After this. Jesus knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is 